this is Ways and Means um, on April 22nd. We have, um, we spent some time this morning and then we went over to House Ed for a joint meeting. And now we are back here in Ways and Means. And we are going to talk about some of the revenue and tax implications of a recent study that um, the PEGS commissioned that is on our committee website. Um, it is quite a comprehensive study but want to sort of um, guide folks who are about to testify and the committee that we're really gonna be focusing on um, some of the sort of corners of revenue and tax that are brought up by the study um, when we have these conversations today. We're not gonna get into sort of an overarching um, conversation around public access TV because that is not our jurisdiction. So. Mr. Blum, if you could start us off um, and take us through the implications of the study that you completed. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I'm Peter Blum. I uh, lived in Vermont for 35 years. I now live in Massachusetts. And I was uh, I'm the principal of Berkshire Telecommunications Consulting. And I uh, was hired to do this project and, and prepare the report. Um, I may know some of you, I know uh, Representative Ansel from many years back, more than either of us probably want to admit, and a few of your faces are familiar. Um, I have prepared about 20 slides today to talk to with you. I expect uh, that I was asked to limit it to about 20 minutes. Um, and I understand that also that the members have access to the slide deck and that I will not be sharing my screen. Is that right? All right. That so, is right. We like to see each other's faces. So Okay, so um, I will then begin to talk about these slides. The first is a title slide. Um, the second is a summary of the study. Uh, you probably already know that PEG means public educational and governmental programming. Uh, the task, the main task in the study was to provide options to ensure this future financial stability and viability of PEG channels. We looked at the likely financial future, the possible efficiencies and other forms of organization that are possible. We looked at possible new financing mechanisms and that is gonna be the focus of what I talk to your committee about mainly today. Um, because of the time limitations uh, in your schedule, I excise some of my normal presentation here and I will not be talking today unless you have questions about cable history, PEG history, the multiple roles that PEG organizations are now filling, viewership data, efficiency options, or changes to business model options. Um, just as in a very brief summary, Vermont PEG funding comes 92% from cable companies pursuant to a fixed rule of 5% of revenues that was established under delegated authority to the Public Service Board about 20, uh, 30 years ago, um, almost 30 years ago. The remaining 8% of PEG revenues comes from fees, memberships, donations, and other sources. Oh, I should tell you, if you're trying to um, play the slides as, as a presentation, you'll find it annoying that I have done these sort of fly-in animations. So probably easier to just look at the, at the file without uh, presenting it. We're actually, so, um, because of the way our legislative website works, we can only upload PowerPoints as PDFs. Um, our oh, consortium needs to convert them. And so we are seeing the PDF version of that on our website. You, you, which, you um, see the whole hearing. slide? Do you see the whole slide with the... Uh, like, I, I don't remember which ones had the fly-ins, but um, when I present them, I, I sort of put in the first paragraph and then I click and the second one flies in. Are you able to see the whole slide or just part of the slide? The slides look full to me. Okay, good. Then let me know if there's a problem. I'll keep going. George, okay, so you, can you pause? George, are you looking for something or are you good? I, have, I don't have the slide deck. It's under... Um, Mr. Blum's name. I have, what I have under his name is the entire report. If 
Financial viability of PEG access television in Vermont? I, I sent yes. both my report okay. this morning and I've the got, slide I've got deck this yesterday. One now. The source I just deck. renewed. Okay, Everyone? I've got this one now. Okay, everyone good to go? Okay, back to you. Sorry about that. Okay, Representative Till, we're on uh, slide four. Um, the um, expenditures of the PEG organizations total about $8 million a year and the size of their budgets is quite variable. The largest being about 800,000, the smallest being about a 10th of that. Federal regulation of cable is substantial and sets a lot of the parameters around which uh, you can't really navigate. Uh, the Cable Act of 1984 was a seminal uh, provision. It's been amended a few times since um, it's also, if you're reading decisions and, and such things, you'll see it referred to as Title VI of the Communications Act. Uh, it allocates responsibilities between the federal government and franchising authorities. And in most of the country, the franchising authority is a city, county, or municipal government. Vermont is not unique, but unusual in that the franchising authority in Vermont is the state. And the Cable Act of 84 gives the states very limited authority over cable rates. Title VI also sets limits on the franchise fees that can be imposed. 5% um, of cable revenues of the cable companies is the maximum that can be mandated uh, for states uh, for payment for PEG. Vermont allocates all of that 5% to PEG. Um, capital expenses are an additional category, and in some places, there's an additional charge for capital expenses of PEG organizations. Um, some places, this is standardized. In Vermont, it's there. Most of the PEG organizations do receive additional payments, uh, and these are negotiated uh, in, periodically when they uh, sit down to uh, negotiate their contracts. General taxes are not uh, within the franchise fee restriction. Next slide, uh, slide five or six, I can't tell if it's five or six. State regulation, uh, you have delegated a regular authority to the Public Utilities Commission, which used to be called the Public Service Board. Uh, PUC Rule 8000 was adopted in 1991, so it is 30 years old. Um, the PEG organizations are certified by their cable companies and not by the state. The cable companies, once they have certified a PEG organization, the cable companies must provide channels for AMO programs. I'm sorry about this. I, AMO is a synonym for a PEG organization, and I thought I had edited it to delete all the AMOs, so you'll have to go with me and recognize it. AMO is synonymous with PEG. Uh, they must pay for AMO operating expenses. As I mentioned, it's a uniform 5% of gross operating cable revenue. They must pay capital expenses enough so that the PEG organizations can operate. The, the actual payments vary from zero to 1.25% in Vermont. And uh, one nice thing for me was that the AMOs file detailed annual reports with the Department of Public Service about their finances and operations. That simplified my study a great deal. Two big things have happened since 1984. Um, one of them is that the digital, uh, the digital revolution has allowed for the internet to provide for streaming of video. And um, this has reduced cable subscription rates and reduces PEG revenue. Uh, PEGs also have switched to digital technology and, and internet streaming and they're doing a great deal of this and which increases the convenience of the customer because you don't have to watch if you're not, you don't wanna watch the 8 p.m. program at 8 p.m. you can watch it another time. And it also expands their service footprint um, outside the area where the cable service is available. The second big change since 1984 is telecommunications competition. And um, 
it sounds like it wouldn't be fundamental, but it truly has been. Every uh, medium for delivery of digital data now is in some measure in competition with all of the others. It is no longer the case that cable companies are fundamentally different from telephone companies. They're all just pushing data as fast as they can uh, and as reliably as they can. So this makes some of the old so-called silos and some of the industry taxes that are based on those silos look increasingly dated and unfair. We did a rev history of the revenue and the forecast on PEG revenue. Uh, we found that the um, AMOs slash PEGs generally had stable revenues over the last five years. Previously, they've been increasing. Uh, last five years, they've been stable with one little blip, uh, well, one pretty big blip in 2019 because of an accounting change. Um, our revenue forecast, uh, we produced a low normal estimate for five years out showing that payments would decline to 7.04 million, a loss of about 0 0.8 million. If, the, if you add to that a 1% inflation cost, then the 2026 deficit would be about 1.4 million or 17% of the current spending level. We didn't quantify some risks. Um, one risk is that the FCC would be restricting state fees and charges imposed on cable companies. And I'll talk about more about that in a few minutes. Um, increasing cable company losses in video subscribers was something that we tried to estimate, but uh, it turns out that um, more recent information suggests that what we called a low normal estimate was actually pretty optimistic. Um, we thought that the um, loss of cable subscribers would be likely to be in the range of about 3%. And it looks like it might be more like about 6 So if bad news is coming for the PEG organizations, it is coming more rapidly than we thought in February. And finally, there could be at some point, we don't, we're not predicting this, but we recognize that there could be a strategic decision by the cable companies that they'll just simply stop really pushing their cable services and stop supporting them and, and put all their marketing and other emphasis, financial emphasis on internet, in which case um, PEG revenues would be declining even faster. So I'm gonna talk now about um, the Cable Act and other financial constraints on your, on your freedom to act. Um, I see I'm using my time, the time is slipping away, so I'm gonna try to pick it up. Uh, I mentioned the 5% franchise fee of the, under the Cable Act. The FCC issued something that is, they call the third order, which has the potential to really erode uh, PEG revenues. Um, what they are saying, what they said was that in-kind services can be subtracted from the 5% cap. And in Vermont, the CPGs of uh, the cable companies require them to provide potentially uh, quite a lot of in-kind services, including um, internet services uh, to schools and public buildings. Uh, the third order is still on appeal and the oral argument was in Cincinnati a week or two ago. And the uh, accounts of those who watched the oral argument uh, indicated something of a route likely for the FCC. So we may not have to worry a great deal about this third order um, and, and the Cable Act. Second financial constraint is universal service. Vermont has had a, uh, what was then a very progressive uh, universal service program enacted in 1994. Um, it was uh, somewhat unusually based upon intrastate and interstate telecommunications revenues. We survived the challenge of that for many, many years. Um, but there are many limitations now on universal service programs that came about in the 1996 Federal Telecommunications Act. And time being so short, I won't go into the details, but there are, on the slides, there are four different rather vague proscriptions um, that any of which could knock out uh, a universal service mechanism that you use to provide for PEG funding. Unfortunately, litigation since 1996 has not clarified these concepts. 
And uh, so there's a substantial risk in using universal service concepts and language to solve the peg problem. The third is uh, probably the most serious risk is barriers to entry. Um, Section 253 of the Federal Act says that states cannot enact anything that would serve as a barrier to entry in the telecommunications market. Uh, there's also a uh, provision that says that states, it's called the safe harbor provision, which allows states to do uh, uh, require compensation for management of public rights of way. The case decisions um, have not greatly clarified this. Uh, it looks like there have been clear decisions that a municipality or franchising authority that retains unfettered discretion to say no to a new entrant is going to lose on the 253, which is more or less obvious. The dif more difficult question is how large a burden can be imposed financially on a new entrant before a violation of 253 exists. And the courts and the FCC have different opinions about this. The FCC issued an order a little while ago that um, in the, mostly in the wireless context uh, shows that they have a very aggressive posture about restricting state charges. The fourth uh, constraint is the Internet Tax Freedom Act. It says that states cannot tax internet access. It's now a permanent provision of federal law and uh, there are exceptions for universal service, of course, if you meet the FCC's view of what the minimum standards are, which we, as I've discussed, are quite vague. But there's also an exception for 911 and E911, which uh, if I have time, I'll discuss in a minute. Financial constraint number five is FCC broadband policy. And um, time being so short, I will skip ahead and just say that the FCC took a very aggressive stance against states and in favor of restricting state charges and regulation of internet. And um, they were slapped down um, in the DC circuit in a very important case. However, their authority to object to state programs uh, that are uh, founded on uh, universal service principles, uh, the, the FCC still retains broad discretion in that area. Can I, so try now, to, can I interrupt for a second and try to summarize that for myself to make sure I'm following you? Sure. Um, so essentially, a few states have tried to tax telecommunications infrastructure as um, part of a right of way, like with a right of way provision, but that might be um, federally prohibited because it's considered a barrier to entry into the market. Is that? That, that I think of the five that I've okay. listed, I think that is the Great. most worrisome. Thank you. And uh, especially given the FCC's attitude as expressed in an order from last year or the year before. And, um, would, if you wanted to move ahead in that, I, I could talk with you more about how you could just limit your litigation risk uh, in that area. Um, so, Madam Chair, I've got, I'm, looks like I've gone 20 minutes or 18 minutes, and I've got about um, five options to uh, present to the committee. Should I go through them, or should we stop for questions? Or it would be great if you could go through them and then we'll sure. have after and you and Lauren can, Lauren Glenn can take up um, which of her time you grabbed from her afterwards. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, first option is to uh, impose a new 1% charge on cable revenues. Um, this has been done in some of the other states where 6% is the normal payment rate rather than five. Um, some of the, uh, uh, cable companies are actually paying some of the Vermont PEG organizations more than six right now, although I don't know how long that will last. Um, but if you were to do this, you would impose a new 1% on, on cable revenues. You would have to spend it entirely on capital expenses, and there might be some burden to show that um, it is actually being spent on capital expenses. But it, this is a kind of a loophole in a federal 5% restriction. Um, it's not competitively neutral. It increases the burden on cable companies and it sort of ignores the fact that a lot of the PEG programming is going out now through the internet. Um, 
and it involves a state treasury and a kind of a transaction with very little marginal effect for the pegs. Option two would be a new streaming video charge. Uh, this would be a charge on uh, streaming video, which as I understand the sales tax already applies to this service. Um, it could also be applied to satellite video services if you felt it was unfair to overlook that. Um, the, um, the charge has been upheld at least once in a Chicago case against the Commerce Clause challenge. Um, other states are considering enacting such charges. Massachusetts has currently a bill in the House and a bill in the Senate that imposes such a charge. Um, and I can talk about that if you have questions about it. Uh, it could improve the alignment between the Vermont residents who benefit from the PEG service in the modern age, which are not necessarily people living in the footprint of the cable company, uh, but people who are viewing uh, PEG content through internet streaming, it would better match those who benefit with those who pay. And of course, a disadvantage would be it's a new tax and there's a lot of cost for new taxes any new tax. Uh, third option is to raise the VUSF rate. Um, the VUSF, as I mentioned, is, was enacted in the 90s. It was a telephone, uh, uh, sort of a pan telephone program that was designed to support all telephone related pro public benefit programs. But now telephone has, because of uh, digitization and, uh, and competition, telephone is no longer really a meaningful separate industry and uh, so PEG is sort of a first cousin to telephone and you could expand to the VUSF to cover that. Um, there are complications. Um, most of the funding goes for E911 now um, and there are some disadvantages. The VUSF is funded by telephone surcharges and it may not be fair to telephone customers to add an additional burden for PEG services. And that's both uh, landline and cell phones, right? What's that? That's both landline and cell phones, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and um, the federal limitations on universal service prevents broadening the base to include internet access payments. This is something where the F FCC has been sort of standing defiantly in the doorway, blocking states from doing this. Uh, <clears throat> Four is a poll attachment charge. This is a new idea as far as I know. Um, it's The idea is based on the fact that Vermont uses uh, utility poles for almost all of its telecommunications. In the Midwest, they bury cable, uh, but in Vermont and in the whole New England, it's uh, up on utility poles, partly because of soils, partly because of history. Um, but every kind of telecommunications provider uses these poles to get their, even the wireless guys, the so-called wireless providers are really wireless only in the last mile. They use a lot of fiber to get their signals to their uh, antennas. This is more competitively neutral than charges on cable companies or on telephone companies. Um, again, it's a new tax. Um, you, you would have to give credit for peg payments uh, that are uh, being charged to the cable company so that you didn't violate the 5% franchise fee limit. And there are some possible complications with highway rules, which I heard uh, at, when I, at the end of my study, I, I ran across some objections from the highway department, but I was not able to make any sense of them. So it's something you would have to look into. Um, finally, I present a multi-part option, which, uh, for the purposes of showing how interconnected everything is, if nothing else, combines a bunch of things. I suggest creating a Vermont Telecommunications Public Benefit Fund. This would be sort of the 2021 equivalent of the Vermont Universal Service Fund, applying more broadly to more industries. I suggest it would be funded by an attachment charge. I estimate $10 a year per attachment would allow for a little bit of PEG revenue and it could be uh, expanded, the, the rate could be increased if PEGs need more money. Um, I suggest repurposing the Vermont Universal Service Fund solely as an E911 fund. This would allow you to, um, to fund it with a charge, not only on telephone, but also on broadband access using the Internet Tax Freedom Act exemption. Um, 
and it, it, the VUSF is largely a 911 fund already in terms of the percentage of the money. I suggest a new capital fee of 1% on cable companies. This was either my first or my second recommendation repeated here. And I suggest that you repeal a telephone personal property tax, which is a whole other discussion for which I don't have time. But I, I would uh, suggest you do, devote some of the proceeds of the poll attachment charge to hold the general fund harmless. And in the slides, I won't take any more time to go over this, but um, the slides show the puts and takes that, that all five of these things were put together, uh, producing a uh, net increase of 0.34 million for the pegs, but about 90% of the money or 85% of the money generated by the poll attachment charge would basically be used to hold the general fund harmless for repeal of the personal telephone personal property tax. And my recommendations are that you encourage the AMOs to continue their efforts to improve efficiencies and seek additional sources of funds. And you treat option five seriously because it modernizes the state's telecommunications tax structure. And with that, I'll end, Madam Chair. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I don't hear any. I don't either. Okay. It was all perfectly clear, hey? It was all perfectly clear. And I think we're all trying to, we're all um, diving in deep into the PowerPoint here. I know I am. And I'm, it's a lot I'm, to absorb. And the, I, I provide a source with the report if you want to look at it or call me back if you want. I'll be glad to come back and talk. I just, before we go to questions, I just want to say hello, Peter. I'm sorry that I missed your opening. Uh, Hello and greetings. Hi, it's nice, so to, nice see. to see you. Yeah. Lauren Glenn, would you like to jump in? Certainly. Um, I'd also say that Peter gave a fairly extensive presentation at Senate Finance and uh, House Energy and Technology. So I can post the link there if anyone wants to hear his full presentation. Um, this report is very important for us. And I'll just go back to the beginning. I'm Lauren Glenn Davidian. I'm the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. We're based in Burlington. We're celebrating 37 years of public educational and community access television. And we're part of a network of 25 centers that provide PEG services, community media services to all of us here on this call and people across the state. And that group of 25 is known as Vermont Access Network. We're a mutual aid society. We work a lot together on legal cases before the Public Utility Commission. And we have recently put together a Vermont Community Television Channel. Um, Comcast gave us a channel statewide that we're now operating. And we have a variety of projects that we do together. So it became clear um, to me, at least in 1990, when the phone companies were getting into the cable business, that this question of um, finding alternatives to cable franchise fees for community media purposes was a pressing question. So that means it has been pressing for 30 years, um, but it is really in the past couple of years that we're seeing the rubber meet the road on revenue decline. In fact, Comcast um, gives us a report every year of the amount of revenue they provide to all the access centers. And last year report was six point, no, 7.4 million. And the report that we just got for FY20 um, was 6.8 million. So that's a uh, almost 9% and that services that we- Are others, is it? Sorry, is it my connection or it's Lauren Glenn's connection? Um, maybe if you turned your video off and talk to us as a faceless voice. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I'm happy to be a faceless voice. Thank you. Is this better? All right. That's I'll much try. better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So. <clears throat> So we've seen a 9% decline in cable revenue across the state of Vermont, affecting different centers more than others. This is a trend across the country. The reason this is important, why is this important? Because um, our communities depend on our services. And in particular, during the pandemic, we provided a variety of 
important services to keep the continuity of community operations going, whether those were government meetings or media education, or as I mentioned before, election coverage. Um, so I don't think we need to make the case to you now that PEG is important. Obviously, the state believes it is. Um, we received some COVID CRF funds for this work, and also you funded this study. So the question really is this. The regulatory structure of, this, of telecommunications and the taxation system needs to be modernized. That's the principal recommendation of this study. The Federal Communications Act puts each different communications method, whether it's telephone or cable or satellite, into a different silo. And we know that cable service is running on the same fiber that internet service is running. So these historic regulatory silos are being laid bare as um, no longer the correct framework for thinking about the commercial use of the public rights of way. And essentially what this report does is it provides a way for A, the state to understand what authority it does have to assess taxes and fees on internet service. Admittedly, it's very narrow. The feds made sure of that. But I think what's really important here is the legal justification for the authority that the state does have to assess and modernize its telecommunications tax structure. So I would really point your attention to those recommendations that Peter has made in this report. Um, the second piece is that all, all the companies that use the public right of way, whether it's a phone company or a cable company, provide some kind of public benefit in exchange for that use. And that's the central principle here. Whether that is universal service, whether that is E911 subsidy, or whether that is PEG access, those are public benefits. So the other key point I would draw your attention here to here is this proposal to create a basket of public benefits and to, in a sense, integrate 911 universal service and PEG services into one kind of public benefit that serves those purposes, some of which are suffering from the decline of landlines and cable use. I mean, principally 911, you know we have a problem there. And um, has us thinking about a basket of public benefits that accrues from the commercial use of the public rights of way. So this idea of pole attachment fee or some kind of way of assessing commercial use of the right of way is really the modernization leap and uh, change. And maybe it's not a leap, but update that is required at this time. At the end of um, the testimony I provide are two visuals, one that sums up the sort of financial situation of community media in Vermont, and the second that summarizes the policy recommendations. So those are meant to be easy reads, um, but I do wanna urge you for us to spend more time at some point on the authority the state does have to modernize the tax structure. I would also say that there are two other states, one Massachusetts in particular, um, that is looking at an alternative way of funding PEG, and that is through a streaming programming assessment. And um, what we're seeing in sort of the other parts of the country now is this interest in taxing program service providers in effect. Um, I'm not so sure that's the way to go, our conversation with the FCC media lawyer recently, um, she thinks that that's a kind of vulnerable way to go legally um, because you're, you're taxing programming services and they're not strictly regulated by the feds or by the state. So I really think that the future is thinking about this, the value that could be extracted from commercial use of the public right of way. And with that, I will pause and see if video works again. Happy to answer any questions. I think we've covered quite a bit in the written testimony as well. And our purpose is to determine if this is something that your the legislative community is interested in looking at more deeply next year, um, because we know this session is coming to a close pretty soon.
Thanks. And, you know, there's no legislation on the table for this. We're, um, and it's an area of tax that we sort of touched on when the broadband bill went through our committee, but we really didn't dive into. And this is just um, an opportunity to see if there's um, something that folks are interested in pursuing longer term. And Clay is going to Clay is going to join us um, next up to continue to this sort of conversation about the regulatory environment. Um, thank does you. Does anyone have any questions for Lauren Glenn? And thank you, Lauren Glenn. Thanks. And this is a big. We've been like deep in ed finance, and so this is a big brain shift for all of us. It's a whole different set of um, acronyms and corners of the universe. So thank you. Clay, I think the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Clay Purvis, for the record, uh, Director for Telecommunications and Connectivity with the Department of Public Service. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I wanna thank uh, Peter Blum for his presentation and, and report. Um, I think it's a good starting point on talking about uh, telecommunications taxes generally and, and ideas for reform. Um, I provided to the committee uh, an, an overview or chart of uh, telecommunication specific taxes uh, that we've identified uh, here in the state of Vermont. I, I gave that chart to uh, House Energy and Technology uh, last week. Um, it's very high level, very simple. Um, but uh, I'm happy to go over that first and then uh, switch to um, some uh, commentary on uh, the PEG access report. Um, at, yep. Is there a question? Sorry. No. Okay. I was just saying that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, as you know, um, there, there are two types of taxes, I think, uh, that we should look at. Um, a good way to break it down are taxes and fees that are passed through uh, to consumers and then taxes and fees that um, are, are paid for directly by a company. So consumers don't see those taxes. Now, consumers pay all the taxes that a company would pay to the state um, through, um, through the, the cost of the service they're, they're buying, but um, some taxes are shown separately on your bill. You pay for them specifically, whereas others are borne by the company. And this chart is only telecommunication specific taxes and fees. So we're not talking about taxes and fees that are generally applicable to any business operating in Vermont. Um, the first chart breaks down um, taxes by service type. So we have broadband cable and then um, telecommunication services or voice services. Um, as, you, as Peter alluded to, um, there is no taxation of the internet. Uh, this is widely prohibited. Um, there are a few exceptions in the um, in, in the Tax Freedom Act that um, um, allow states limited taxation if if they were raising USF funds before the act was enacted. Um, Peter talked about the 911 exception, though I, I don't think that that's quite as um, um, uh, widely used as uh, Peter suggests it could be, um, it is there. Um, but that across the board, we, we do not tax internet services. And this is problematic in that um, many telecom carriers offer bundled services. So how they attribute revenue between the several services they provide, say internet, uh, television, and voice service, um, really has an impact on the revenues that the state collects from taxation. Um, as Peter talked about, cable video services are subject to sales tax. If you look at your Comcast or your charter bill, you'll see that the video is, is uh, there's a sales tax applied to that. Um, and then the PEG access fee shows up separately on your bill. It's 5% of the cost of the video service. Um, and um, in the state, we're uh, raising um, around around eight million, um, and as Lauren said, it, it fluctuates. Uh, but 
around $8 million a year. That all goes to public access to television. Um, telecommunication services, uh, we have sales tax, we have the Vermont Universal Service Fund. So this is 2.4%. Um, there are, um, we, we could come back and talk specifically about the Universal Service Fund at another time. I think there's a lot to say there. But right now the rate is 2.4%. Um, revenues are about 5.5 million. They are declining steadily. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a troubling decline one that we're seeing across the nation. So other states, USF funds are seeing the same or similar decline. And uh, the Federal Universal Service Fund uh, increases its rates quarterly to make up for uh, losses. I believe the uh, Federal Universal Service charge now is 33%. You'll see that on your bill. It's a very expensive tax on your bill, uh, at least compared to other taxes. Um, and then there's a federal excise tax um, which is charged on non-long distance charges. Um, I believe that might be used for TRS, federal TRS, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, in state, we have two other taxes that are specific to telecoms. Um, this is the gross revenue tax, which funds the uh, Public Utility Commission and the Department of Public Service. Uh, this, fund, uh, this tax is levied on other utilities as well, electricity and gas, any utility that is regulated by the Department of Public Service and the PUC, um, the, uh, we raise a significant amount of revenue um, uh, under these taxes. So a significant portion of the PUC budget is funded through um, gross receipts tax uh, applied to telecom and cable providers. And then we have the telephone personal property tax. It's a very small tax. Uh, levied on about 16 companies in the state, um, mostly telephone, you know, the, the incumbent telephone carriers. Um, and that's been a tax that's um, been identified as one for uh, possible repeal or reform. What's CMRS? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Um, commercial mobile radio service, this is your cell phone. And is it not paid by them because no one told them to pay or because we're federally prohibited from that? Or what's the? Uh, the telephone personal property tax. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly. That might be a good question for the tax department. Okay. Um, who, uh, they're um, in, in charge of uh, enforcing and collecting on this tax. Um, it, it may have something to do with the antiquated nature of the language in, in the statute. Um, it may have a lot to do with the definitions of personal property uh, as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, the way the uh, cellular industry is set up, um, the, there are non cell companies that own most of the infrastructure that is that is used by the, the cell carrier. So for instance, um, the, the pole structure, the cell tower itself is usually owned by a third party um, real estate developer. Some of the big names in, in that industry are um, American Tower, Crown Castle International, um, SBA Towers. Uh, those are the three that come to mind, um, but they don't actually provision telecom service. They simply rent space on the pole to carriers. Uh, so the actual amount of um, facilities that companies like AT&T and Verizon have uh, might be smaller than, um, than um, your traditional telephone company. They may also be paying, I don't know which 16 companies are paying, um, that's confidential tax information. Um, and I actually pulled the 16 number from uh, Peter's report. So. Um, you know, there's not, um, uh, given the number of telecom providers we have in the state, you know, it's, it's obviously not covering everyone, but um, uh, I, I would assume that the traditional telephone carriers are um, paying into that, uh, that are paying that tax. Um, the revenue's been declining, um, mostly due to the fact that most telecom 
terrier's plants are almost fully depreciated. So there's, there's not a whole lot left to tax. Um, so the, the revenues have been declining steadily. Right now, uh, they're at 3.5 million. Um, House Energy Technologies asked me to kind of put together um, some history charts, you know, showing uh, the revenues for these various um, taxes over time. And I'm happy to share that with you when, um, when we have that put together. So I'll move to... Uh, One second, I think um, Jim has a question oh. for you. Um, hi, Clay. Um, with regards to a pole attachment charge, could we, uh, could we include um, telecommunication, telecommunication, telecommunication towers to which there are things attached also? Could that be included in the same bucket or is that too different? I, I, I don't know the answer. It may, again, it may be helpful to have um, the Department of Taxes come in and, and weigh in on um, the, um, the viability of, of the pole attachment tax. Um, I think that at, just as a general policy, um, and, and Peter suggests this in his um, PowerPoint, that um, you know, there, there, there certainly is a concern that taxing pole attachments uh, or other telecommunications infrastructure um, may be a deterrent to expansion of telecommunication services. Certainly universal service of broadband and voice, uh, wireless voice service in the state is a, is a state goal and, and one that we're, I think we're gearing up to uh, spend a lot of public money um, trying to solve. And um, we'll have to look carefully at uh, what the, um, what the financial implications of, of doing that would be, how much money we would raise um, and um, what the cost of enforcement is. Um, we're, there are over 250,000 telephone poles in the state with at least one telecom attachment. Um, in many cases, as many as two and three, sometimes four attachments on a pole um, and so, um, how, how are we going to enforce that? How are we going to ensure that um, carriers are being accurately ta um, taxed um, on their attachments? Um, would be would be something of interest uh, to me as we uh, pursue that um, that uh, recommendation in, in more detail. Um, but in addition to that. Um, I think Pete, Peter rightly pointed out that there would have to be a, uh, a credit on the 5% uh, franchise fee. Um, the franchise, ca the, the cable franchise fee is a charge uh, allowed under federal law to be levied on cable companies for use of the right of way uh, and to be used for cable related purposes. PEG is one of those purposes. So, um, you know, it, it, it would certainly the, the cable industry's tax is capped at 5%, whether other care companies would pay a larger percentage or a smaller percentage based on, um, on the uh, attach the number of attachments they have is, is an open question. But when you're talking about uh, expanding into very rural areas where the population density is low, um, and the cost of service is already high. The business case there is marginal and small changes such as changes in tax structure might have a disproportionate effect on uh, rural broadband deployment. So um, it would be interesting to see how the tax once applied uh, in the, to the industry, how it would affect individual actors in the industry. So would it have a disproportionate effect on say EC fiber, you know, compared to their revenues versus uh, a company that, like a cable company, which is not required to go into rural areas and makes a business out of serving the village centers, the, the denser areas, um, that there may be some unfairness there. Um, how technocratic we get about that and how we try to compensate for that. Um, you know, I, I think it could um, get interesting uh, pretty quick. Um, 
you know, is the tax worth our time given the, the amount of work uh, that the tax department might have to do, um, you know, that government would have to do to ensure proper collection of that tax versus the amount of, of revenue um, we're collecting. Are you um, saying that is other, are other people experiencing the echo? Is, is it my uh, I connection? Oh, I have, I be gone I now. Okay. Um, are you saying that a cent, there would be more pull attachments per customer for providers that are serving more rural areas? Yes. And so, okay. And then my other question on that is, are you also saying that um, the revenue that we would be able to collect if we did add a fee or a tax to pull attachments for cable companies wouldn't ever be allowed to go over that 5% because we'd be prohibited federally from doing that. I don't, I hesitate to say that's the way it would turn out. If, if I were a cable company, that's certainly the argument I would make okay. uh, when I sue the state of Vermont for trying to exceed uh, the 5% uh, franchise uh, fee. So, um, I, I don't know how that would play out in litigation, but certainly when, um, well, I mean, I'll be blunt. When you, when you draw the ire of the telecommunications industry, you do need to set aside something for uh, your legal defense fund. So, um, you, you know, some of these uh, propositions I would anticipate would be challenged in, in federal court. Um, we would need to be prepared to defend those challenges and um, and, and that certainly that comes with a cost. I was imagining that for compliance, you would have someone on your team drive around to all of the polls the way that you did to check, you know, a few years ago to check to see how our cell service was going on. You're going to have to give totally me a, kidding. A, a few, totally a kidding. few, more, Completely a few kidding. more people to drive around. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, Jim, did you have another question? Yeah, just briefly, Clay, thanks. Thanks for the nuances that you've described, which I wasn't aware of earlier. And I think I heard you on on uh, the radio, you know, a couple months ago talking about these things and, and peg access and that sort of stuff, or maybe it wasn't you. But at any rate, um, on first pass, Easy Fiber likes the pole attachment thing because it treats us all the same. Although you certainly describe, it, describe complications that may work may make it not worth our while. No, so thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I, I may be wrong. Um, it's, it's, there are many very uh, smart and um, thoughtful people at EC Fiber who um, thought through this um, qu quite a bit, but um, you know, I, it, it could be, uh, and certainly something to think about. Um, we want to see uh, companies like EC Fiber and, and Consolidated and, and Comcast extend their networks and reach people um, that, frankly, uh, a lot of industry players aren't that interested in doing because the business case isn't there. Um, and so the effect that any tax would have on the business case of rural expansion, I think, needs to be carefully considered. Lauren Glenn, did you want to add something? An important part of uh, the study talks about uh, not, uh, revenue neutrality isn't the word, but in essence, if, if, if the cable companies, and Peter could speak a little more about it, but if the cable companies were assessed an additional fee in the scenarios that Peter spells out, the franchise fee would be reduced by that amount. So it wouldn't be piling on more and more costs. Um, so I think that the, there's a principle here in the study that's important because it is meant to balance costs across all providers and not to burden any one of them disproportionately. Right, Peter? Um, Madam Chair, may I, may I comment? Yeah, I, I think um, the idea of a new charge on a new pole attachment charge that would be paid by the um, CUDs is a little bit distasteful at the moment. And I, I only, my only response would be <clears throat> it's less than or equal to the amount that they're now paying for pole attachments to the pole owners. 
so I, it would be a little wind in the face for the, the communications union districts, but I don't think it would be necessarily determinative. And I, I really appreciate hearing from Representative Maisland that um, EC Fiber has recognized the importance of competitive neutrality in the long run uh, and not having silo specific taxes the way we do now. Yeah, I, I think that that's certainly a principle um, that should guide any kind of um, tax reform. Um, we, we are taxing 21st century technology with 1980s and early 90s statutes. So um, things have changed and um, it certainly is time to consider whether um, our taxation uh, meets uh, today's technology. Um, but the last thing I, I did wanna raise with um, the committee on the poll attachment is um, the issue that uh, Peter discussed with AOT. Um, we have heard consistently from the Agency of Transportation that fees levied for use of the right of way um, uh, would need to, by federal law, be uh, deposited into the transportation fund and, and offset federal funding uh, for highways. Um, not all uh, roads are state highways subject to um, that limitation, but um, you may, uh, the committee, if it's interested in, in this proposal, um, may want to hear also from AOT about um, what federal limitations um, might preclude uh, uh, a poll attachment fee from being used to support PEG or any other um, uh, purpose um, that's not for the use of right away. And then, Clayton, um, did you have more you wanted to add thoughts on the Universal Service Fund? I, I do. Um, if, if it would please the committee, I'd be happy to come back and talk more about the Universal Service Fund specifically. Um, it, it's certainly um, under a lot of pressure right now. Um, the fund supports several very important telecommunications programs, um, TRS, it's relay service that's for a deaf and hard of hearing um, populations uh, so that they, they can uh, access uh, you know, telecommunication services. Uh, the lion's share of the fund goes to 911, um, which is also very important. And then uh, we are funding broadband through that. So the fund actually, um, I wanna be clear, the fund actually raises enough revenue um, to uh, overall uh, to potentially support its programs. Uh, but the way the fund is structured, 0.4%, uh, that 0.4% or uh, one fifth of the fund is dedicated to broadband. So there is a positive balance in the fund, uh, but the money can't be used to pay the other programs like 911 and TRS. Uh, it is reserved for um, broadband deployment. So. Um, there is there is a you know cash in in the bank so to speak, but um, it, it we're limited in, in how we can use a fifth of that money, and so we can't pay 911's bills right now, or the fund can't support 911's bills. Um, there are certainly um, some things that um, we should consider, and, and I know that the legislature uh, is interested in taking a look at contribution reform uh, next year. Um, right now, the fund rate is set by statute, uh, which is different from other states. Uh, many states um, have an administrative proceeding to set the rate. The rate is usually set based on the, um, the revenue requirement to meet, to meet the fund's obligations. So, um, you know, in other states, once they have the 911 appropriation, then they set the rate through their their public utility commission or some other administrative body uh, that reflects the, the appropriation. And then um, two, the, the rate is usually set annually. So it fluctuates with the cost of the fund. Some states have also moved to a, um, rather than a, a percentage of um, retail sales like we do here, uh, they've moved to a a fixed fee per line and service. So 
no matter whether your cell phone costs $40 or $50, you'd pay the same amount, you'd say like a dollar uh, that would go to the fund. And that has helped stabilize other states' funds as they've seen a decline in the, um, the revenue generated from the sale of telecommunication services. So there are things that other states are doing um, that might be worth looking at and um, certainly something that uh, the department would be willing to, uh, to study if asked to do so. I personally <laughs> Curious about that. I don't know about other members of the committee. Um, do folks have other questions? Clay, is there anything else you wanted to add or? Um, no, I, again, um, I think this has been a great discussion, uh, both in, in HET, Senate Finance, and, and in this committee as well. Um, I, I do think that uh, these ideas merit further exploration. I just um, uh, would recommend uh, we exercise caution as we move ahead um, on, on some of these proposals, just to ensure that um, the risk of litigation is low and, and the, um, the application of a new tax doesn't have uh, unforeseen consequences for uh, broadband deployment and the like. Representative Durfee. Clay, you mentioned uh, bundling earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm imagining that the cable providers or, or whoever the, provi the providers here, they're, they're all faced with the same set of circumstances. So they're ultimately gonna end up uh, allocating the what they charge the customer more or less in the same way to the different services that they're that they're bundling together is is that the case and uh, is there do we have any control over how they how they allocate it if if it was to in our interest to serve consumers uh and and they're and therefore allocating things a little differently, perhaps than than the interests that the companies themselves have. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I, I believe there is um, th there are uh, generally accepted accounting standards for the okay. allocation um, or attribution of of revenue for bundled packages, and and I know that that uh, a, a change in those standards actually played into um, the. Um, 5% decrease that peg stations saw in their franchise um, fee revenue uh, back in 2018. So um, is, I would assume that these carriers are following generally accepted accounting practices, um, but those accounting practices um, do have an impact on, um, on our revenues. We also have the prospect of cord cutting in the future. So um, you know, a lot of people have stopped buying cable television. Um, cable TV is now competing head to head with streaming services like Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus, um, and people are switching in and out. So even if they are buying cable, it's uh, it's not generating um, a, a, as much profit as it might not be generating as much profit for cable companies as it used to because of things like churn. The, the constant switching back between services and, um, and and also people trying to limit the amount they pay for cable. Um, you know, they're constantly trying to go back and get the better deal. You have satellite now competing with them. So the market for uh, video uh, programming is, is quite competitive. And um, certainly I would foresee that having an impact on uh, to traditional cable video service in the future. We are going to need to wrap up in just a couple of minutes so we can finish a bill about um, pet food supplements and the like, which I don't remember the bill number of. But I'm wondering, um, Peter or Lauren Glenn, is there anything you wanted to add before we? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I just want one little footnote for something that Clay mentioned um, the question of 
Um, what are the restrictions on the use of revenues from right of way fees in certain federal highways? And I think Clay accurately presented the summary of that federal law that was uh, that I heard from the Vermont Agency of Transportation. But I encourage the committee, if you think that's a problem, I think encourage you to look a little deeper. I haven't looked all the way to the bottom, but I did ask what the statute was that on which they were relying. I read the statute and it seemed to me that the statute was dealing with the question of if the federal government gives a state money to build a highway and the state later abandons that right away and sells it, does the federal government get some of the money back? And the answer based on that statute is yes. But this is a much different situation and I could not find any cases that supported this broad interpretation that the Vermont Agency of Transportation uh, took to the statute. So it's a question that you should look into carefully. Thank you. Madam Chair, I just wanted to say thank you very much and um, thank you, Chair Ansel. Also, nice to see everyone. Um, and we look forward to figuring out how I, we might be able to move this large question forward, even though PEG is uh, a part of it. I think it's a larger question that goes beyond the funding of community media. So thank you. And thank you, even though we've spent most of our time focused on the much larger question, um, just really wanna commend and thank all the PEG stations for all the incredible work they've done through the pandemic to keep government accessible and in people's homes and thoughts. So thank you for that. I hope I could capture that testimonial and use it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and Emily, thank you for sharing um, those. Uh, enjoying just being able to listen for a change. Um, so committee, we're gonna, at, uh, shortly, 11.45, I guess, we're gonna go back to S-102, which is the Ag Bill. And um, Sorsha, I think Carrie Chaguer is able to join us at 11.45, is that right? Yes, uh, and, and Dan Dickerson as well. And Dan as well. So we've got five minutes. I don't know what to do with it. Shall I take us offline for five minutes? Um, sure. Okay.